have you this morning. What an exciting day. Resurrection Sunday. Amen. And, uh, I'm always blessed. Every time we meet on a Sunday, we're actually giving recognition to a risen Saviour. Amen. What a blessing. All right. Psalm 119. Psalm 119. Brother Mick's already heard this, but he might get something extra out of it. Psalm 119. Obviously, the Browns didn't want to hear it again, Mick. <laughs> yeah, they're down at the down at the shopping centre at uh, Coffee Club. <laughs> Psalm 119. Good to have the Goodmans back with us. What a blessing. We missed you guys. Good to have you back. Looking forward to hearing Chris sing this morning. And uh, pray that Jeff will not have any hindrances to him being here this morning. Because <laughs> I haven't picked any songs as yet. So, But I'm believing that he's going to be here. Amen. All right. Let's pray, shall we? And then we'll get into the lesson this morning. Father, we do want to thank you and praise you for the opportunity to be in your house this morning. Father, we're going to open the scriptures and we pray, Holy Spirit, that you would open our eyes of understanding, that we may glean from your word this morning. Pray that you would teach us and help us. Pray that you'd fill each and every one of us, that we may hear what you have to say in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Psalm 119, verse number 33. Teach me, O Lord, the way of thy statutes, and I shall keep it unto the end. Give me understanding and I shall keep thy law. Yea, I shall observe it with my whole heart. Make me to go in the path of thy commandments, for therein do I delight. Incline my heart unto thy testimonies and not to covetousness. Turn away mine eyes from beholding vanity and quicken thou me in the way. Establish thy word unto thy servant who is devoted to thy fear. Turn away my reproach which I fear, for thy judgments are good. Behold, I have longed after thy precepts. Quicken me in thy righteousness. Now, we've been going through Psalm 119 for the last few weeks. The title of Psalm, the, the series for Psalm 119 is, is Living Life for Such a Time as This. So we've been looking at a few principles through this psalm as far as living life. And we looked at uh, his way or my, my way in the way. We looked at the key to not wandering. Uh, we looked at wondrous things, uh, open thou mine eyes that I may behold wondrous things. Last week we looked at uh, done and dusted. This morning I want to look at a subject that maybe most of us here this morning would not even contemplate it about doing. And the, the thought is found in verse number 38 where he says, Establish thy word unto thy servant who is devoted to thy fear. Devoted to thy fear. Can I ask you a question this morning? Are you devoted to fearing God? Most of us wouldn't even thought, think about that concept. About devoting ourselves to fearing God. Now, we know as Australians that we can be devoted to many different things. All right. Now, let me just share this with you. Noah Webster in his dictionary said this, that the word devoted means appropriated by vow, solemnly set apart, dedicated, consecrated or addicted. So what is it that you're addicted to in life? All right. What is it that you're consecrated to? What is it that you are devoted to in life? Now, the spiritual person would say, well, I'm just devoted to Jesus. Well, that's good. But have you, are you devoted to fearing God? Because we live in a society that does not fear God. And unfortunately, in the day that which we live, if we're not careful, if it hasn't happened already, that type of attitude creeps into the, into the house of God where even God's people do not fear God. Now, I'm not talking about being afraid of God. Because he is my father and I don't think I should be afraid of him because I want to have a relationship with him. But the term fear means to have that reverence and that respect. All right. Now I want you to hold your place here and I want you to go over to the book of Hebrews for a minute. Hebrews chapter 12. Hebrews chapter 12. And I want you to have a look at this. In Hebrews chapter 12, dealing... Uh, Dealing in the area of chastisement, uh, verse number six, for whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth and scourgeth every son whom he receiveth. 
If ye endure chastening, God dealeth with you as with sons. For what son is he whom the father chasteneth not? But if you be without chastisement, whereof all are partakers, then are ye bastards and not sons. Furthermore, we have had, the, we have had fathers of our flesh which corrected us, and we gave them reverence. Shall we not much rather be in subjection unto the Father of spirits and live? So the writer of Hebrews is saying that our earthly father who would chastise us and tell us off, we, we reverenced that person, most of us. We are in a generation where young people don't want to reverence their parents. But we reverenced our earthly father and the Bible says how much more should we give reverence to the father of spirits and live who is our heavenly father, who is our God. So we ought to be reverencing and respecting him and we ought to be devoted to that in our life. Now I was watching a show on Monday night, I, I love my football. I love football, played sports when I was growing up, doesn't look like it now but I did. Believe me, I played sports growing up, I, and I, I really love NRL. I, I, when, when Lawrence comes over, who is an AFL devotee, you know what I mean? It's like I always put the AFL down, you can't go past the NRL, love the NRL, who wants to follow? You know, I say in the NRL, there's more hard tackling than what you get in the AFL. I mean, that's just a fairies game, you know what I mean? So I like, I like the NRL, you know, and I've got one amen up the back there on a sporting comment, hallelujah. I'll take an amen wherever I can get it. But I was watching a show on Monday night called 100% Football. And it had the big wigs on there like uh, um, Phil Gould and so on and so forth. Well, Phil Gould was interviewing the New South Wales Sports Minister. And in the interview, the Sports Minister for New South Wales was asked uh, about the, uh, the, the football grounds in, in New South Wales. And how that every other state is... is Far surpassing New South Wales in their, in their football grounds. Now, NRL, which is uh, rectangular, so we're not talking about oval shape, we're talking about the rectangular grounds. And the sports minister for New South Wales said, look, we're, we're planning on doing this with a the, with the stadium at Parramatta and we're thinking about uh, building a bigger stadium here and, and it's going to be so good and it's going to fit so many people in it and, and we're just committed to building bigger and better stadiums. Why are they doing that? Because Australians are devoted to NRL. Australians are devoted to sport. They love it. And so therefore, because Australian public is devoted to that, then the government is going to build bigger and better stadiums because, let's face it, it's an idolatry thing when it comes to Australia. I mean, we just love our sport. We love our sporting players and we put them on a pedestal and everything. And so because we're devoted to that, they're going to build the bigger and better stadium. So Australians can be devoted. But what about us as Christians? Are we devoted to fearing God? Because he says in verse 38, Establish thy word unto thy servant who is devoted to thy fear. No ifs or buts. He says, I am. I am devoted to reverencing and respecting you, God. Now, I made the comment that we live in a world that does not fear God. Now, Romans 3.18 says this, there is no fear of God before their eyes. So the world does what it does because they have no fear of God. Now, we also, if you think about this for a moment, why, when, we, when we're talking about wrong things, why do we do the wrong things that we do? Because... And I know we battle with the flesh, I, I get all of that, but if we were devoted to fearing God, would that not then curb some of our wrongdoings, knowing that there is a holy God who will chastise me because of what I do? Because we just read it, he chastises and scourges every son. All right. So if we're devoted to fearing God, that fear of God, that holy reverence and that holy respect would be something that the Spirit of God uses in my life to curb the wrong actions. Amen? I believe that. Now, Psalm 36, verse number 1. Listen to this, if you would. Psalm 36, verse 1. Uh, the transgressions of the wicked saith within my heart, 
that there is no fear of God before their eyes. So David is saying this, that the transgressions of the wicked says to me, there's no fear of God in their eyes. So we look at the world and we see what the world does. We see how that, uh, that Easter, Easter is recognised for so many things now, except the true meaning, which is the resurrection, the death, burial and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Right. It's mentioned a little bit in the news. Um, you know, you hear the news reports. Oh, you know, it's a special day for Christians and lots of people are going to church and they show you a Catholic church or an Anglican church. And I think, my goodness, that's, you know, anyway, we, we know about that. But they give, they give all of two seconds to what the real meaning of Easter is all about. And then it's all about Easter eggs and this and that, blah, 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 blah. And off they go because really it, it's just another day for the world to have a holiday and that's all it is so we look at we look at what the world is doing and we it says to our heart there's no fear of God in their eyes but wait a minute wait a minute C could we not being careful could we not look at a believer and look at some things that believers do and say within our heart that brother that sister doesn't fear God because if the brother or sister feared God, then they wouldn't be doing what they're doing. Talking about in a negative aspect. Right. All right. So we can, we can get a witness in our spirit, in our heart, that the world doesn't fear God because of their actions. But likewise, and I know oh, what pastor says, judge not. We're told to judge righteous judgment. As a matter of fact, this word has already judged. Already judged. So if a brother or sister is doing something contrary to the word of God, the Bible's already, already judged that, right? So we look, at, we look at that and we think, wow, brother, sister, why are you doing that? If you, if you had a fear, if you were devoted, if you were addicted to fearing God, then you wouldn't do that. Psalm, uh, Psalm 11 verse 10 says this, that the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. In Proverbs 1 and verse number 7, the Bible says that the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. So when we fear the Lord, when we fear God, when we reverence him and when we respect him, we are saying this is the beginning of wisdom. This is the beginning of knowledge. But let me just say this. If a brother or sister in Christ is not fearing God, therefore they're not displaying that wisdom. They're not displaying that knowledge. That's a dumb person right there. Absolutely dumb. It's dumb of us to try and live life without fearing Almighty God, who we should be devoted to fearing. Now, <clears throat> let me just give you a few things quickly. We've got 15 minutes. I want you to turn to the book of Exodus. Exodus. And I want to give you four things about the fear of God. Exodus 18. Now, this is a subject that is it, you really, it, you, you can't confine it to a 30 minute block of time. Because you, you, there's just so many things that you can bring into this aspect of, of fearing God. But I want to I share just four thoughts that I had about this. And uh, in, in Exodus 18, we see that Moses' father-in-law gives Moses some counsel about how to, um, how to rule and how to lead the nation of Israel. And I actually think it was good counsel. I believe it was good counsel. He mentions it elsewhere. I think it's in the book of Numbers as well. Now, I want you to have a look at this in verse number. Uh, uh, let me see. Verse number 17. Moses' father-in-law said unto him, the thing that thou doest is not good. So Moses was doing basically everything. All right. Listen, let me just say this. Can I just say this as, as a church? It's not good for the pastor to do everything. All right. It's not good for the pastor to do everything. As a matter of fact, if a church is going to function as it should, then there's, there's a, a, a structure that's set up to relieve the pastor from doing things that other people can do so he can focus on the main thing. All right. So I know we're not big at the moment and so on and so forth. So we don't, we're not going to have this type of structure yet. But I just want to sow that seed thought in your mind that it's, it's not good for the pastor to do everything. 
If the pastor is doing everything, I said this to Brother Chris before, if the pastor is doing everything, then the church will develop a welfare mentality. And the welfare mentality is, well, the pastor will do it, his family will do it, the missionary will do it, and we're just going to come along and just sit and enjoy everything. So you've got to be careful that we don't develop that welfare mentality. And the way that we don't develop that is really by everybody pitching in and helping so that, so that a pastor or a missionary can, can focus on what he should be doing, right? Amen? Amen? All right, help me with that. Verse number 18. Thou wilt surely wear away. Now look at this. So Moses, his father, was saying, you, you're going to wear away here. But, but, but both thou and this people that is with thee, for this thing is too heavy for thee. Thou art not able to perform it thyself alone. Hearken now unto my voice. I will give thee counsel and God shall be with thee. Now this is what Moses should be doing. You, Moses, be thou for the people to Godward, that thou mayest bring the causes before God, and thou shalt teach them ordinances and laws, and shalt show them the way wherein they must walk, and the work that they must do. So Moses' job was to pray and intercede, to preach and to teach, to counsel uh, the, the hard matters, and to show the way in that they should work, walk and the, and the work that they must do. That, that's, that was the leader's responsibility. My, my job as a pastor or our job as pastors is to, is to intercede for you, to pray for you, to get messages ready, to preach and to teach, to, to instruct you in ordinances and the statutes of God. And remember, we have ordinances of baptism and the Lord's Supper. And remember I said on Tuesday night that ordinances, God is very particular about his ordinances. There's rules and regulations in regarding God's ordinances. And, and he says, I, I, I as a pastor am to show you how you ought to walk. In before God, that is how you're meant to live and the work that you must do. So this is what father, Moses' father-in-law is telling Moses what he shall do. Now look at this. He says this, verse number 21. Moreover, thou shalt provide out of all the people able men. Now what's this next phrase? Such as fear God. Men of truth, hating covetousness, and place such over them to be rulers of thousands, rulers of hundreds, rulers of fifties, and rulers of tens. So Moses' father-in-law says, Moses, this is what you are to do now. Moses, you are to look out into the congregation and you are to choose, number one, able men. And a criteria here is they must fear God. All right. So number one, when we're thinking about fearing God, the criteria for leadership, spiritual leadership, is you must have a fear of God. Understand that? And if you want to be in any, any type of spiritual leadership position, the, the criteria is fear God. Why is that? Because you are, you are ruling over God's people. Or I, I am ruling over God's people. Chris is ruling over. Anytime Brother John gets up and he's teaching and preaching the word of God, he, he's in a sense ruling over God's people and there ought to be a healthy fear of God when somebody does that. So when we go over into the New Testament, we won't. But you know, in Acts chapter 6, where the apostles told the church, you look out among you, seven men full of honest report and so on and so forth. We're, we're, we're paralleling what's happening here into a New Testament church where you have a pastor who has been given certain responsibilities and he may have assistants or associate pastors, then you've got deacons, and then you've got the congregation. So this structure is something that God set up way back in the Old Testament as far as a leadership structure. But no one should have any type of spiritual leadership position who is not devoted to the fear of God. Because if we're not devoted to the, if I'm not devoted to the fear of God, do you know what that's going to give me, give me license to do anything I want to do? Amen. It will. If I don't fear God, I can treat you and do things to you without having any conscience before God because I don't fear God. So I ought to have a fear of God. Every pastor, every every deacon, every assistant pastor. Uh, pastor's wives, deacon wives, or, you know, you, you know, Sunday school teachers, there ought to be a fear of God. Now, I want you to go over to uh, uh, 2 Samuel, 2 Samuel. All of us understand the importance of the last words of a dying man. Would you agree with that? The last words of a dying man are the words that most people remember. 
All right, now David is on his deathbed. David's about to pass off the scene. Now look at verse uh, 2 Samuel 23, look at verse number 1. Now these be the last words of David. All right, David the son of Jesse, people still turning, 2 Samuel 23 and verse number 1. Now these be the last words of David. David the son of Jesse said, And the man who was raised up on high, the anointed of the God of Jacob, and the sweet psalmist of Israel said, The Spirit of the Lord spake by me, and his word was in my tongue. The God of Israel said, The rock of Israel spake to me. Now look at what God says to David. He that ruleth over men must be just, ruling in the fear of God. Ruling in the fear of God. So we must be just ruling in the fear of God. So we're looking, at, we're looking at a criteria of leadership. Now, I know, as I said before, that we're not in the, in the 50s, the hundreds or whatever. But this is important for us to know because even in the home, what about spiritual leadership in the home? As husbands or as, as mothers, as parents, that, that's a leadership role that God has delegated to you and we ought to as parents and as husbands and fathers, we ought to lead our homes, we ought to rule over our homes, not as a dictatorship, because God's not for dictatorship, right? But we're to rule justly before God and in the fear of God, because God's given us a position that's very important and we ought to be reverencing and respecting God because that fear is going to it's going to channel my thoughts and my actions, what I'm going to do and what I shouldn't do. Right? So criteria for leadership is fearing God. Secondly, go to the book of 2 Kings. 2 Kings 17. 2 Kings. Who likes having victories in life? Amen. Everyone likes to have a victory in life. No one likes to be defeated. No one likes to be beaten. I certainly don't. I'm very competitive in that nature. I, I, I like to win. I don't play to come in second. That's right. What is that? I play to be number one. Except when I play golf with Chris, then I have humble myself. <laughs> and I come in second. Close first. <laughs> Close first. Close first. But everybody likes to win. Everyone wants to be victorious. Everyone wants to win it. Now listen to me. It is Fearing God is critical. Critical for victories. Look at 2 Kings 17 verse number 39. 2 Kings 17 39. God speaking to his people. But the Lord your God ye shall fear. And he shall deliver you out of the hand of all your enemies. How many of us have got enemies? And I'm not talking about your husband, your wife. I'm not talking about your children or your neighbours, all right? <laughs> we wrestle not against flesh and blood. So I noticed a lot of hands went down there. It's like, oh, that's not my enemy. <laughs> we have spiritual enemies, all right? We have an adversary, the devil. Who, by the way, always remember this, principalities work through personalities. All right? Principalities will work through personalities. So, you know, if someone rubs you the wrong way, you don't like their personality, watch out because the, the principalities and princi pa pa principalities and powers here may use that personality in your life. But the person's not your enemy. Satan's our enemy. And anything that Satan is for, we should be against. Because anything that God is for, Satan's against. Now, let me just say this. Every one of us has an enemy very close to us called our flesh. It's called our flesh. Who here hates it when the flesh gets the upper hand? I do. I hate it. I, I, times where it's like, oh, why? You know, and how many of us as parents, <laughs> confession is good for the soul, how many of us as parents have risen up in a fleshly way towards our children, said something that, and by the way, when you say it, you can't get it back. So you've got to be careful. And then, then, then what you have to do is humbly go before your children and say, I'm sorry. I shouldn't have said that. I shouldn't have did that. Unfortunately, I've done that a number of times. And you can ask our kids. <laughs> this right here. You know, because the flesh rises up. 
and, and we yield to that flesh and it's just, it, I want victory over that. And because of the death, burial and resurrection, amen, because of that we can have victory over the flesh. We don't have to yield to the flesh. We don't have to succumb to that. We have to strengthen areas in our life that are weak. And you know, and I know the weak areas of my life. And with the help of God and His Holy Spirit, we can strengthen those things. But I want victories over life. We don't fight against the Perizzites and the Hittites and the Jebusites and the Canaanites. We fight predominantly with principalities and powers and spiritual wickedness in high places. And more often than not, I've said this before, we can be our own worst enemy. We can be our own worst enemy. So if you want victory in life, then it is critical that you have a fear, a reverence of God. Amen? Amen. All right. Let me, uh, let me finish with this one here. I'll just give you the last one. The, the third one is we're commanded because of the promises. We're commanded to fear God. And fourthly, I want you to go to the book of Ecclesiastes. Ecclesiastes. I want you to have a look at this one. How is uh, Coffee Club, Brother John? Wonderful. <laughs> Ecclesiastes chapter 12. Ecclesiastes chapter 12. Fearing God. Now listen, it's the concluded duty of man. The concluded duty of man. All right, Ecclesiastes 12. Look at verse number 12. And further by these, my son, be admonished of making many books. There is no end and much study is a weariness of the flesh. Let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. All right, let's sum it up now. Let's, let's, let's hear the whole matter. What's the first two words? Fear God. Keep his commandments, for this is the whole duty of man. For God shall bring every work into judgment with every secret thing, whether it be good or whether it be evil. So what's your duty? What's my duty? It's a duty, by the way. It's not a desire in a sense, because if it was a desire, it's like, well, you know, because we're quite happy to do the things that we desire. Oh, I love doing the things that I desire. But it is a duty of God for you and I to fear him, to reverence him, to respect him. And you know what? Duty, duty kicks in when you don't feel like doing it. There are some times where I don't feel, feel like door knocking. I really don't. I don't feel like going out and, and believe it or not, talking to people and knocking on strangers' doors and, and all of that. There's, there's times where I don't feel like it. But I do it because it's commanded. I do it because it's a, it's a Christian duty to tell others about Jesus Christ. So the concluded, the concluded duty of man is to fear God, reverence him and respect him. Now let me close you with this question. Are you devoted to, are you a devotee to fearing God? Are you addicted? Are you consecrated? Or are you too busy being devoted to other things? All right. So it's time to take a, an inventory of life. Who am I devoted to? What am I devoted to? Am I devoted? See, you can say, you can be, say I'm devoted to God, but are you devoted to fearing God? To reverencing and respecting him. Amen? Amen. All right. Father, we love you. Thank you for the word. Thank you for this opportunity now that we can fellowship. We pray that you'll bless that fellowship time and the food in Jesus' name. Amen.